seems a long time ago. That's when the first cases of COVID were identified in the UK. We all know what followed. One of the most worrying phrases we got used to was new variant. Well, there's another one now. It has a high number of mutations and comes as COVID infections are surging. At the height of the pandemic, we'd often see my next guest on our screens. Professor David Sridhar is the Chair of Global Public Health, Edinburgh University. And it's the time when students will be returning to universities in their tens of thousands. Uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning. This new COVID variant, um, we're told it has a high number of mutations. Uh, what's special about BA286? Well, I think it's this number of mutations. It's still a sublineage of Omicron. And so in that sense, we're still in the Omicron age. But I think here what you're seeing is its ability to reinfect those who have already had a previous version of Omicron, as well as how transmissible it is. And so those are the concerns um, but I would say that, you know, early studies are showing that it is not more severe in terms of its health impact and also that it's not having a higher hospitalization rate. And those are the two things that we're watching carefully in terms of future variants. The um, UK Health Security Agency says that uh, 28 cases of the new variant were from a single outbreak in a care home. Um, does that tell us anything particular about it and, and give us any indication of what we should be doing when we're rolling out vaccinations this year? Well, I think what we know is it's highly infectious. And so we are seeing this spread rapidly in those kind of environments where you have many people in, a, you know, in an environment where they can infect each other. I think it comes back to the booster question of who should actually be getting a booster this autumn as we head into winter, given that we know protection wanes from a vaccine over time. And there is a real case to be made for widening the criteria for who gets a booster. And as we already know, moving it sooner so that people have that protection if they are exposed to a new, a new kind of sublineage of Omicron. Well, in fact, um, the, the vaccination program begins uh, again tomorrow. And... Uh... Old folks like me apparently are entitled to it from day one. Uh, is it in your mind that we should expand that from the over 65s to, for example, include people who are over 50? Yes, definitely. Definitely. And actually even pushing farther to making it accessible to those who want to have it. If we are moving towards a yearly program similar to seasonal flu, we do allow younger people, those who are living with those who are vulnerable, um, to go out and actually get vaccinated against flu. You can go to a pharmacy and have it done. And so I hope we are moving to a similar model which is that if you do feel that you are vulnerable, even if you're not in one of those official categories, if you're living with someone vulnerable, if you just don't want to feel rubbish from COVID and want that extra boost for your immunity, that you could go out and get the vaccine. And so I think there is speak, you know, talk about this happening in future years, but given what we're seeing, COVID's still around. There's still a lot of it. There's still people ill with it. We should be thinking, how do we actually get it out now, quicker, faster, across into pharmacies across the country? So take it seriously, but... Um... There's nothing in your mind that says that, that we need to worry about return to lockdown. Oh, not at all. I think people have associated public health with lockdown, but this was an incredibly extreme response that was happening in 2020 because it was a deadly disease, including for young people. And hospital systems, whether it was in Italy or here or India or anywhere in the world, were becoming overwhelmed with patients. And so I think we have to change our mind in terms of 2020. What was happening before we had a vaccine, before we had widespread immunity, the clinicians knew how to treat this, to where we are today, where it has layered on top of the infectious diseases that do make us sick and unfortunately, you know, put people into hospital. So we're still trying to manage it. But proportionality is the key here that actually we're trying to say, how do we maintain all the things that make our society great in terms of, you know, people being able to live their life how they want to, but in a way that limits the damage in terms of the health, you know, the negative impacts COVID has. Um Forgive me for doing th this, but as we have you on, as a, you're an important leading member of the Indian heritage diaspora in the UK, and your background is um, in the United States, where there is an equally important Indian diaspora. Um, got the Prime Minister, Indian heritage, in India uh, today, who's referred to himself as India's son-in-law. Uh, what did you think he meant by that? Well, I think, you know, he wants right now to strike a trade deal with, with India, and there is a real need for us to be integrated across the world, especially given that we're no longer as integrated with Europe. And so I think there it's trying to have closer relations. 
But I think the larger point as someone who has an American accent, who's a British citizen, who has Indian heritage, is that actually you have more and more global citizens and we can't be put in one box of what are you? We are in a bit a part of everywhere in the world. And I guess the other thing which I think is promising to see across the world, especially in Britain and in the States, is that skin color is no longer hopefully the defining thing people see, that actually, you know, in the end, our skin color is different because, you know, thousands of years ago, when we migrated out of Africa, we ended up at different, you know, parts away from the equator. And the higher away that we were in the north, in Scotland, you needed to have lighter skin to absorb vitamin D, where if you were closer to the equator, you had darker skin. You can map skin color to actually UV light. And so I think kind of reinforcing to people that we should be judging politicians or whoever else is out there on their policies, on their merit, on terms of, you know, who they are as people, what they are contributing, and not based on the most superficial thing about someone, which is what color they were born with because of where their ancestors ended up with, you know, um, yeah. many hundreds, thousands of years ago. So that's, I think, the promising oh. thing right now. I understand the point essentially about discrimination, but uh, there is an interesting and curious thing. Um, several of the world's top uh, uh, global uh, companies, Microsoft and so on, are now led by uh, Indians. And uh, where you are in Edinburgh, um, you know, the capital of Scotland, the contenders to lead Holyrood are both Scots of Indian heritage. Um, that feels like more than an accident. It feels like it's telling us something interesting, though I have to confess I'm not sure what that thing is. What do you make of it? Well, I think if you look at global population stats, you know, people from South Asia probably make up one in eight people on the globe. So it's not surprising to see that actually they're represented across the globe in those kind of roles. Um, I think there's also probably a mindset among immigrants. If you come to a country or your parents have come to a country that you want to contribute, you want to show that you're useful to society, that you want to work hard, that you want to actually, um, yeah, show that actually that it was the right decision to have open migration and to allow people from all over to live in a certain place. So I think probably that's why you're seeing, at least in the United States, you know, growing up, this ethic of kind of work hard, contribute to society, try to make wherever you're living better, and why you're seeing that kind of, those kind of public roles, or even in the U.S., I guess a lot of private CEOs are increasingly of South Asian heritage um, coming and becoming more prominent. Devi Shridhar, thank you so much for joining us again.